We're, we're the New York City uh, iGEM team, and this year we continued our work on uh, Huntington's disease research, which we started last year, where we won uh, a bronze medal. Yep, and motivated by this objective, um, we formed a very diverse team of over 27 total students um, across six U.S. states, and that represents more than 18 schools across the country. Um, due, to a, due to the large size of our team, only a portion of us were able to make it today. Before we go on, we'd like to give a special thanks to our mentors, uh, our Frank, for his uh, continued support and guidance throughout. Uh, to uh, Susanna M uh, for her uh, leadership and with the lab work, and to uh, Sunny O for her uh, support and assistance. Yeah, and next up, um, we'd like to give a, um, a warm welcome to our next presenters, Selena, Caitlin, and Yumi, um, and they will talk more about why we chose to study hunting kids. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm how many of you have heard about Huntington? Sorry. Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Great. How many of you have heard about Huntington's? Okay, this makes my job a lot easier since at least some of you know about it. So as you can see on the map, this is a estimated representation of what will happen in 2050. So it represents the Nevada population who will be over the age of 65 by 2050. So as you can see, the majority of the world, major including majorly advanced countries like you know, America, Asia, and South America. It's primarily those countries, and this is resulting in a global epidemic of aging people. This is due to advances in technology that, and health that help people live longer and increase their lifespan. Okay, so this has resulted in an increase of like, neurological diseases that normally don't occur ages in life. So these include Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and Huntington's. As you can see, there's a total cost per year of $354.9 per year, and this is only in the United States. This is, is, is extremely large compared to the actual revenue of the United States, being split which is only 12, around 12 pounds a billion. So as you can see, there's a disparity between funding for healthcare and the amount of so some people might say, why is Huntington so important when compared to Alzheimer's and Huntington's considering there are a lot of people that are affected? But the main difference between Huntington's and the other two diseases is that Huntington's primarily affects Europeans, so this smaller ethnic group just results in a smaller number of people affected, but the ratio of people affected are comparable to Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. So to explain why we decided to go for So what exactly is Huntington's disease? Huntington's disease is a hereditary, fatal, autosomal dominant dis disorder that promotes the progressive breakdown of neurons in the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia is a group of structures in the brain that, that are involved in the control of voluntary movements and emotions. Thus, the symptoms of Huntington's disease include difficulty moving limbs, loss of balance, impaired speech and memory, <coughs> mood swings, and depression. Um, because Huntington's disease is autosomal dominant, a, a, person will, a person will display these symptoms, in, a person with a Huntington's gene will certainly display these symptoms in their 30s or 40s. Because of this late onset, People, patients typically have children prior to discovering that they themselves have Huntington's disease. Their children will have, will have a 50% chance of inheriting this genetic disorder. Okay, now that we've talked about Huntington's disease on more of the human body level, I'll be going into like, what is Huntington's disease on the more uh, cellular or more neuronal level? And that is that there's a, it's caused by a trinucleotide repeat of, of CAG, um, for more than, for usually more than 40 um, codons in the Huntington gene. And actually, as Yuman just mentioned, that it's an odd, it's a late onset um, genetic disorder, but there is a subset of Huntington's disease called juvenile Huntington's disease, 
where the uh, codons will aggregate much earlier on and can um, come more in like 20s and early 30s. And that accounts for actually five to 10% of all Huntington's disease patients. And this Huntington gene that I mentioned is actually recently discovered. And so scientists don't really know how or why all of a sudden the Huntington's disease Huntington genes degenerates. And so, as you may know, the current, the central dogma is that DNA transcribes into RNA and that <coughs> RNA trans, uh, translates into protein. And so there are many scientists uh, looking to attack DNA, Huntington's disease on the DNA level, which poses a uh, risky side effect and symptoms that we don't really want to uh, risk. And targeting just on the HCT protein level and just decreasing that wouldn't really get to the root of the problem because you would only be affecting the already produced um, protein, which is why our research, our um, New York City iGen team decided to research on the mRNA. And to go more into that, uh, Emily, Jaya, and Jay will uh, present next. My name is Emily, and I'll be bit just explaining a bit about um, our research on Huntington's. So our goal was to stop the production of the mutant HTT proteins and to produce the corrected proteins instead. Uh, as Caitlin said, we decided to do this on the RNA level using a technique called RNA displacement. So, uh, we created an mRNA strand that consists of a chaperone guide located on the 5' UTRN uh, and connected it to a corrected Huntington mRNA. On the chaperone is a sequence called the toehold strand, which targets a corresponding sequence called the hairpin layer. That's located on and is, in co in, in, and is common to many uh, mutant Huntington mRNAs and the mutant Huntington mRNA only, so it's not affecting any of the corrected uh, mRNA. Uh, fun fact, it's called the hairpin loop because the folding of the mRNA makes it look like an actual loop. So these sequences were found by a team last year who used computational programming to scan through and identify the most ideal sequences available at that time. So when the mutant mRNA binds, uh, so sorry, when the mutant mRNA strand binds to the chaperone end of the uh, of our produced uh, RNA. Uh, what happens is two things. First, it stops the uh, mutant Huntington mRNA from producing any of the mutant Huntington proteins, and then it also releases the corrected Huntington, uh, Huntington mRNA that was connected to the chaperone, connected to the uh, mutant Huntington mRNA, uh, allowing the corrected proteins to be released, uh, translated from the mRNA strand. Uh, that's what our team did last year. They um, they developed the, uh, the sequences, yeah, but were unable to test it in in vitro models. So uh, um, Jaya will explain a little bit about what how we did um, how we tested the proteins this year in the lab. Okay, so to test our proteins, we used HeLa slash molecule and CFP cell lines. So these are basically HeLa cell lines that have been engineered to produce PolyQ, which is the mutant Huntington protein, and the MCFP is basically a cyanocrossin protein that's attached or bound to the uh, mutant Huntington protein, and we'll use this later to image our Huntington protein. So after two weeks of culturing these cells, we split them into six wells, and then after one day, we added doxycycline. So doxycycline is an antibiotic that's used to control gene expression in cell cultures. And basically what Dr. Seiklin did in our cell cultures is it induced it to actually start producing the mutant Huntington protein. And at one day after that, we transfected the cells or our plasmid with lipopectomy 2000. And we had three groups, one control group that was transfected with no, no mRNA, and the second, uh, the second group, which is our first experimental group, which is transfected with 1.5 micrograms of our plasmid. And the second experimental group, which is transfected with three micrograms. And two days after, we lysed the cells to expose its content, and we um, measured the protein level in the cells with Western blotting. And the problem with Western blotting is that sometimes if the proteins are too big, it can't measure it correctly. And that's where the cyanocrossin protein that I mentioned earlier comes in, because it's bound to the mutant Huntington. So instead of 
Testing can we actually measure the psi of noise input key levels? And we analyzed this with a few software, and Jay will talk about the data. So as Jaya mentioned before, we have six wells with two wells being for our control group, two wells for the 1.5 milligrams of plasmid, and two wells for three milligrams of plasmid. So after we like this up, we perform blessing plotting, and we use it in the software to determine the band intensity of the blessing plots that correspond to the well of the mushroom. So as this graph, this graph shows like uh, the band intensity at the top and bottom Presence. So as you can see, the control group has the highest amount of quantity control group as expected. But it's interesting to note how groups with 1.5 milligrams of plasma and 3 milligrams of plasma don't have as much of a significant difference. So that's a possible area of future research where we try to find the optimal amount of plasma to make this work the best. And also, since we tested this on Kilo cells for our experiment, we could use real neural link cells. Well. <coughs> oh, so now we have human practices like with Rachel, Julia, and So since Huntington's disease is not widely known, our team placed great emphasis on human practices. We wanted to effectively integrate our research into society and to impact public perception on Huntington's. So for integrated practices, we had an opportunity to present at Stuyvesant High School, and we created pre and post questionnaires to test students' knowledge, their knowledge on Huntington's. And for the pre questionnaire, we got a 73% accuracy. And after presenting what our project was and our research results, we got 86% uh, accuracy on the post questionnaire. And Julia will be presenting a public engagement. So we believe in the importance of going beyond the lab and discovering new ways our research can impact society. Um, therefore, we partnered with Huntington Society of Disease Society of America and participated in their New York Team Purple in Long Island at Huntington Center. Um, on the picture, you can see Erica, Selena, Abe, Griffith, and myself at the walk. Our team also registered to join HDSA research web webinar with Julia Alterman, a PhD student at the University of Massachusetts, who presented her work on RNA interference strategies for Huntington's lowering in HD. Um, we also distributed two questionnaires to all of the teams and organizations we collaborated with, and one of the uh, one of the questionnaires was on more like Huntington-related facts, and the other was on research ethics. Um, we also joined as a member of the Huntington Study Group, the largest HD clinical research network of over 400 researchers across the globe. And there, um, like with them, we learned more about improving the quality of life for Huntington's patients and uh, like how families are affected by them, so we got to meet them. Uh, we also registered to attend Huntington Study Group's 25th anniversary an anniversary conference in Texas. Uh, HSG hosts an annual forum for training and education of HD research. Um, we also joined the September campaign of the Cerebral Palsy Alliance Research Foundation. And although Huntington's isn't like directly affiliated with that organization, we thought it was important to integrate it into our um, human practices because it is a brain disorder, and we would like to spread aware more awareness about. Like, global epidemic. So, um, Jennifer will be talking about the collaboration. Not only did we raise public awareness about Huntington's disease, we also collaborated with other iGen teams around the world. First, we appreciate Dr. Ellen Jorgensen of Biotech Without Borders for providing us with a laboratory space so that we can continue our research in Huntington's disease. Biotech Without Borders is a nonprofit community lab located in Brooklyn, New York. As for the iGEM teams around the world, we would first like to point out what we did with London's Westminster University iGEM team. We contributed to their plastic lab campaign by submitting a video on how to reduce plastic 
laboratory waste, and which they ended up using in their presentation. Secondly, we collaborated with an Estonia iGEM team by taking a fun group photo, which they used as part of their mosaic to express the unity of iGEM teams around the world. Then we collaborated with an iGEM team in China at Sun Yat-sen University by filling out a software questionnaire about how software programs can improve the efficiency in research. And with the Macquarie University team located in Sydney, Australia, we filled out another questionnaire regarding human practices. Lastly, we collaborated with New York City's Kingsborough Community College iGEM team by sharing our project ideas with one another. We also contributed to their Ethidium bromine project by submitting six DNA samples. And to wrap up our presentation, I'll give the floor back to Anton. So, that is our work on Huntington's. Uh, we'd like to thank you for watching. And we also have uh, social media, and if you're more interested, you can check us out there. Uh, and we also uh, made a uh, YouTube a music video uh, to promote uh, DNA research and show how it can be fun and cool. And now I'd like to open up the floor to questions. This has been taken in an official matter, but we do appreciate the uh, amount of research and the resources that we have. So, yeah. Would you like us to like explain a little bit about this stuff? Or? The family just asked for your help. Yeah. Okay. Henrietta Lax. So, so you mentioned in one of your surveys, um, I think you said you asked about Huntington ethics. Can you explain more what those questions could you clarify it? So in, when you were talking about your human practices, you mentioned in one of your surveys something around the lines of you asked about hunting some ethics. So um, can you please explain more about that and why you asked about it? Um, so we mostly asked questions on like uh, lab ethics and like uh, like just like using cell lines in, in general, not just related to like pertaining to Huntington's, but like in general, just like um, just laboratory practices that could be considered like, ethical or not. And um, some of the like, for example, like animal testing and stuff like that. And a lot of the responses that we got were like pretty like forward to like science. So um, they were mostly supportive of the research, even though like it could be ethical, ethically controversial. You do that because you have one in the primary of the European. I just wondered if you could expand a little bit on why that is. Okay. Um, yeah, so, as you mentioned before, Huntington's is a genetic disorder, so it is integrated in our genome. And because people from different regions of the world have different genomes, I, uh, I think scientists uh, postulate that it originally, like, appeared in the European genome and that's why it's more primarily affecting Europeans and instead of other instead of genomes in the other parts of the world. I have a few questions too. So I have a question about the gel picture that you guys were showing. And you guys got you quantified the density of your hands. And I was wondering if you could expand a little bit more on how you As I mentioned before, we perform breast hair blotting, and what breast hair blotting does is it, it has antibodies that bind to the protein, specifically for our case, it's the cyan fluorescent protein that also bound to Huntington's, and it produces these bands that show where the antibodies
let us go down. And what we did is we used the software that classifies basically the uh, pages of these bands. And what that tells us is what that allows us to quantify uh, how much antibodies were bound. So it produces a graph like this. So as Jay mentioned before, um, the y-axis band intensity as a proxy for Huntington down the amount of like proteins itself. would show the amount of protein in each cell. 